Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Emily. And uh, I must say it's a distinct pleasure to be here. Uh, I've heard so much about Redeemer and uh, looking at the array of vocation groups uh, is uh, very inspiring. Um, I want to talk to you today about something called faith-based diplomacy, but let me give you a little bit of a strategic backdrop to start with. For about at least the past two decades, defense planners in the Pentagon have been wrestling with the challenges of what's called the asymmetric threat. For those of you not familiar with that, it's a term of art that suggests an attack by creative, unconventional means that a disadvantaged opponent would use against a more powerful adversary, much like bin Laden did on 9-11 to rock our country back on its heels. An attack that cost less than a million dollars and uh, has elicited in excess of a trillion dollar response. So there's a symmetry if you've ever seen it. Well, I think it's clear that Western treasuries simply don't have enough money to protect countries against the full spectrum of possible asymmetric threats. And I think what you really need is uh, an asymmetric counter, one that gets at the ideas behind the guns. Now, the, the Pentagon has come up with its strategy called irregular warfare, which calls for a much tighter uh, uh, coordination of defense, diplomacy, and development. And that's all to the good. But again, uh, it just is not going to get us where we need to be. Now, trying to get at the ideas behind the gun sounds like a reasonably straightforward proposition. Uh, but it's made more difficult by the religious nature of those ideas. And as we can tell from our involvements in Iraq and Afghanistan, the United States has very little ability to deal with religious differences in a hostile environment, nor do we have any ability to counter demagogues like bin Laden or both before him Milosevic, who uh, manipulate religion for their own purposes. And it seems uh, supremely ironic that here we are, one of the most religious nations on the face of the planet, and we're so at sea uh, in our inability to deal with the religious imperatives that now permeate today's geopolitical landscape. Uh, the reasons are many, uh, but several that stand out are at first are having used our own separation of church and state as an excuse for not doing our homework to understand how religion informs the worldviews and political aspirations of those who do not similarly separate the two. Second has been our long-time reliance on the rational actor model of decision-making in which non-rational factors like religion have been off the policymaker's screen. In short, we simply don't know how to deal with it. And finally, back to separation of church and state again, as we so compartmentalize religion in our country that uh, whenever industry or government hears the word, they head for the hills for fear of being accused of favoring one faith tradition over another. And unfortunately, that same attitude gets transplanted on an extraterritorial basis, and you find that these political ambiguities surrounding our separation of church and state intimidate our political and military leaders from uh, addressing that aspect of the threats with which they're dealing. One who clearly stands as, a, as an exception to that rule is uh, General David Petraeus. And when you see him make his presentations before the Congress, especially when he was uh, uh, in charge of Central Command, you know, one of the first things on there is engage religious leaders. But he is very much the exception. Uh, there's very few who understand that if there's a national security dimension and a secular purpose, there's all sorts of room to run. There's plenty of room to run. Anyway, when you marry that with this looming specter of the uh, religious extremism coupled with weapons of mass destruction, it just adds to the urgency for our need to do something to bridge this gap. Well, one form of engagement a new form of engagement that has shown unusual promise is this uh, business called faith-based diplomacy. Now, what is it? Uh, first of all, in the, at the macro level, it just means simply incorporating religious considerations into the practice of international politics. At the micro level, 
It means making religion part of the solution in some of these intractable identity-based conflicts that escape the grasp of traditional diplomacy, like ethnic disputes, tribal warfare, religious hostilities. Uh, if you would like to understand it in greater depth, there is a book that came out in 2003 called Faith-Based Diplomacy, Trumping Realpolitik. And it was a sequel to a earlier book that came out in 1994, both published by Oxford University Press. That one was called Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft. And uh, there is a sequel to those two books, rounding out the trilogy, if you will, the book that was mentioned earlier, Religion, Terror, and Error, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Challenge of Spiritual Engagement. And I want to just uh, read a couple of lines from uh, General Anthony Zinni, who wrote the foreword. And he uh, not only is former commander-in-chief of the Central Command, but he was also uh, U.S. Special Envoy to the Middle East. And so all that I'm going to talk to you about today is encompassed in, in what we're talking about here in his uh, two lines. He says, this is a visionary approach that goes beyond the whole of government effort and, and which expands the current definition of smart power. From my two decades of experience in the Islamic world, I'm convinced that the vast majority of Muslims would embrace this approach as a means of clearly expressing their beliefs and enabling them to understand ours. Um, since our inception uh, as an NGO in 1999, the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy has been practicing this form of diplomacy in different parts of the world. We began in the north of Sudan, and then to Kashmir, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, Middle East, and uh, in the United States itself. Um, I'd like to illustrate what this is about by with reference to our flagship project, which is Pakistan. For seven years now, we've been on the ground in Pakistan, reforming the madrasas, or the religious schools, if you will, that, including those that gave birth to the Taliban. Now, few in the West are mindful of the illustrious history of these schools. As back in the Middle Ages through the 16th century, they were without peer as institutions of higher learning in the world. It was only Western exposure to them that led to our own university system. And you would be surprised at how many of the academic traditions and mores uh, that we enjoy trace their roots back to the madrasas. And it makes sense since they were the inspiration in the first place. But the order boards and tassels you wear at graduation, funding a chair in a given discipline, could go on and on. They all came out of the madrasas. Yet, if you believe what you read in the media, uh, as far as they're concerned, all they are is seed beds of terrorism uh, with uh, very anachronistic people uh, involved. And there's no concept of the history of those organizations. Well, our goals there have been twofold. One is to expand the curriculums because under the influence of British colonialism, they sought and their concern of losing their Muslim identity, these schools purged themselves of all subjects that were deemed to either be Western in nature or secular. Uh, and um, to the point where now the vast majority of them today are about rote memorization of the Quran and the study of Islamic principles. So our goal in the curriculum uh, arena is to uh, include the physical and social sciences, but with a very strong emphasis on human rights, particularly women's rights, and religious tolerance. Now, we don't pretend to touch the religious core of what the schools are teaching. That would be too sensitive. It's very sensitive as it is, as you might imagine. Uh, but our assumption is if we can do a good job on these fronts, the human rights and religious tolerance, uh, that we can smooth a lot of the rough edges. And all of the attitudinal surveys, uh, the independent third party evaluations of our work have suggested that this is a correct assumption. Second and more important, we're trans trying to transform the pedagogy to create critical thinking skills among the students. When we first started out, if a youngster so much as raised his hand in class, he would be punished for disrespect. 
There was no interactive dimension to what was going on at all. And why that's so important is you can find youngsters as uh, young as the age of 12 who have memorized the Quran from cover to cover. They're absolutely clueless as to what it means because they have to memorize it in Arabic. Their first language is Urdu. And they don't get enough Arabic till way later on to understand something as sophisticated as the Quran. So along comes a local militant who misappropriates a little scripture, as all religions are guilty of doing from time to time, as the Dutch Reformed Church did in South Africa to justify apartheid. Anyway, these youngsters, you know, as they're, they manipulate scripture to, as they're trying to recruit them to their cause, and, and these, uh, these children have no ability to question or to challenge. So that's a, a part of what we're trying to do there. Now, at this point, we've uh, enjoyed pretty significant success. In excess, we've engaged in an excess of 2,700 madrasa leaders from some 1,600 madrasas. Uh, the reasons for the success are, are four in number. First is ownership. We, we're doing this in such a way that the madrasa leaders feel it's their reform effort and not something imposed from the outside. And by the way, over there, we never use the word reform. We use the word enhance. And it really fits when you think about their history. And that takes me to the second reason, which is we inspire them with their own heritage. Not only with the heritage of their schools, which, as I say, were the absolute peaks of learning excellence in the world at one time, but going back further in time to a 1,000 years ago, when under Islam you had these pioneering breakthroughs in the arts and sciences, including religious tolerance at a time when Christianity was woefully intolerant. But all this took place under Islam, and the more these folks hear that and internalize it, the taller they walk and the more they start thinking, hey, maybe we can do better. Uh, thirdly, and I think this may be most important of all, is that we, we ground all suggested change in Islamic principles so they can genuinely feel that they're becoming better Muslims in the process. And in fact, they are. And the fourth item is something I don't talk about much. Uh, when, when we do, it bowls them over because they're not used to Westerners uh, admitting complicity in anything. But, but it was, <clears throat> we operate from a posture of humility driven by our understanding that it was we, the United States, that planted the seeds of jihad in the madrasas in the first place because we wanted to grow holy warriors to evict the godless Soviets out of Afghanistan. And if you look at textbooks, for example, uh, University of Nebraska had a $92 million grant from USAID to uh, uh, develop textbooks for these madrasas at that time. And you even take an unpolitical subject like mathematics, and uh, what you'll see is a problem where you know, there's a Soviet soldier standing on a hill that's umpteen meters away, and the bullet from your Kalishnikov goes so many meters per second, how long does it take the bullet to hit the Soviet's head? Well, now, after uh, this succeeded in getting the Soviets out, we left, and now we've come back, and they're doing what we trained them to do, only it's an American head out there. And this is part of the law of unintended consequences that we subscribe to far too often and the whole reason for why our center exists in some respects. Um, what I'd like to do, at the, uh, well, those are the reasons for the success. But what I'd like to do right now is share with you some anecdotes to sort of bring alive how this faith-based diplomacy works. Now, there are five sects that sponsor these religious schools, the madrasas. Uh, <clears throat> there's the Diobandi, there's the Wahhabi, those are the two uh, hardest line. Uh, there's Barelvi, uh, there's Shia, and there's Jamaat Islami. Um, Diobandis are much stronger and more influential than all the other four combined. If there's 20,000 madrasas out there, at least 15,000 of them would be Diobandi. So uh, they are the 800-pound gorilla, if you will. So about six years ago, maybe five years ago, I took two uh, board members with me, and we went over and visited several madrasas that were clearly identified with terrorism. 
The first was a deal Bondi Madrasa outside of Karachi. Student population in that madrasa was about 700,000, of which 500 were girls, but they were in a separate compound. But um, this madrasa was known to be the chief supplier of fighters for uh, Kashmir and Chechnya, but it also had spawned the two most violent anti-Shiite terrorist groups. And uh, walked into a room that uh, I'd say was probably about the size of uh, the middle section here, going back two-thirds of the way. And it was full of rage, uh, rage over U.S. foreign policy and rage over the fact that uh, Lebanon and in, in Lebanon, uh, Israel and Hezbollah were locked in mortal combat, and anything that Israel does, the uh, United States gets credit for. Uh, that was going on at the time. So these were all madrasa leaders and administrators and uh, tough-minded, seasoned uh, Islamic scholars and the like. So to try to get past the rage, um, I t introduced ourselves and said that we were a non-government organization that... Uh, not only were not a part of our government, nor, we, nor had we received any funding from our government. And I said, but while it's true that the United States may have made some mistakes of late, it's terribly important for you to remember when they intervened on behalf of Muslims in Bosnia, Kosovo, Somalia, Kuwait. I said, left untold in most recitations of Somalia are the more than a 100,000 Somali lives that were saved as a result of the humanitarian aspects of that intervention. I said, and while you may fairly criticize the U.S. for operating with a double standard in the Middle East because of our strategic relationship with Israel, I said, so too can you accuse the Arab leaders of doing the same thing, who complain mightily of Israeli mistreatment, but then turn, a, turn around with a deaf ear to Palestinian pleas for humanitarian assistance. So I said, everywhere you turn, there's double standards driven by perceived national self-interest. I said, but that's not why we're here. I said, we're here to try to build on religious values that we share in common to see if we can uh, improve our relationship. And then I proceeded to recite several passages from the Quran that I had committed to memory, a consolidated paraphrase of which would go like this, uh, O mankind, God could have made you one had he willed, but he didn't. He made you into separate nations and tribes that you may know one another, cooperate with one another, and compete with one another in good works. I said, I and my two colleagues are here to open the competition in good works. I said, the three of us happen to be followers of Jesus. And we know that you can't be a good Muslim unless you believe some pretty wonderful things about Jesus. That's very true, by the way. Uh, so let's ask ourselves, if he were standing here in our midst, how would he want us to behave toward one another? And by the time this discussion played out over the next hour, and we got to a little social uh, time afterwards, that rage had been converted to a spirit of total acceptance bordering on fellowship. It was really remarkable to behold. And then we uh, next went to a madrasa up near Lahore that had been identified with the London bombers. <clears throat> same scenario, same results. Uh, but afterwards, uh, several times since then, the leader of that particular madrasa, who is a very large man, widely revered, somewhat feared, uh, has uh, run into our project director on several occasions. Each occasion, he has mentioned the question about Jesus. And he says, it has caused me to ask myself on a daily basis, what would the prophet have me do? And so that madra particular madrasa, which has not enjoyed the benefits of one, of, had the benefit of one of our workshops, but on its own, is sponsoring seminars on peacemaking and conflict resolution. You just never quite know where the seeds are going to grow. Um, and the third scenario was another Diobandi madrasa, and after it was over, one of the madrasa leaders came up to me with a smile on his face, a smile in his eyes, his hand over his heart. He says, you have made me so very, very happy. He says, we thought all Americans hated us. And um, I thought to myself, well, if you read the media, that would be a fair 
uh, assumption, but I reassured him that that was not the case. Another madrasa leader came up and he explained that as a result of his participation in some of our human rights discussions, he had a situation in his village which he felt compelled now to go intervene in uh, on the basis of religious principles. And ordinarily he wouldn't do this because these kinds of things happen all the time, but the situation was a young lady in a village had been caught talking on her cell phone at two in the morning to a young man in another village in whom she had an interest in. So the village elders felt this violated their sense of honor and the young lady was to die and the boy was to lose his nose and his ears. And so this madrasa leader goes back and sits down with these uh, tribal elders. He himself was a relatively young man, so he did this with some trepidation, but he pointed out how in the Quran there was absolutely nothing that prohibited women from talking to men. And he also appealed to the passages that call for a peaceful resolution of differences. So he pulled it off and the situation was resolved, no one was hurt. Hopefully that can be a precedent in that village in the future, perhaps others in the surrounding area. But this was a situation where, you know, religion trumped tribalism in a context where even many Muslims can't tell you where one ends and the other begins. Uh, and it's not always a given that religion's going to trump because uh, they will point out to you that their tribal customs date back 3,000 years, where the, uh, whereas Islam only goes back 1,400. So you have to work at it. Another scenario was uh, a situation where in one of our workshops there was a Taliban commander of some renown. Uh, we were surprised. We have two indigenous partners uh, in Pakistan. One is a prominent uh, Wahhabi, or Ali Hadith as they're called, and the other is a prominent Diobandi leader. And they're the ones that do the recruiting for our workshops. Uh, in this one workshop, this Taliban commander was there, and he was, uh, despite being renowned, he was despondent. He lost two sons in the fighting. And he said, you know, so we don't know what America wants. You come after us with guns, we have no recourse but to respond in kind. So this led to an invitation for me to come to the mountains to explain to their senior leadership what America wants, which I did two months later. Um, in the meantime, I did my due diligence at uh, state defense and the agency to make sure whatever I said was consistent with U.S. policy. And uh, I, I find myself up in the mountains of Pakistan in the Malakand Agency, which is uh, right across the border from Afghanistan, and the province in Afghanistan is Nuristan, which you read about sometimes in the news. Uh, walk in uh, to the room, and there's 57 Taliban commanders, uh, several tribal and religious leaders. And I give them the introductory piece about not being a government organization. I said, in fact, if the truth be known, if our government had its wishes, this me meeting would never take place. And I was trying to dampen their expectations with respect to how much influence they thought we had over our government. But we, uh, I told them, and I said, we, the reason we were there was to see if we could build on commonly shared religious values to develop a confidence-building measure that could point toward peace. I said, but to do that, you need to understand the Western perspective on what's going on here. So I told them what America wanted, which quite simply was to lay down their arms, distance themselves from Al-Qaeda, and uh, um, reconcile with the Karzai government. And then we got into uh, extended discussion, about three hours, and uh, there was a lot of venting, as you might imagine, during that time. And it was very clear from the looks on some of their faces that some of them were much less pleased to be there than others. But uh, several penetrating questions came out, one of which was, what do the American people want? And at that, I breathed a sigh of relief because it meant they were still cutting us some slack despite the fact we'd already uh, re-elected the administration that was causing them their problems. I said, well, what the American people want is peace in the region with democratically stable governments in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
and they wanted to know why we were attacking Islam, and I reassured them, uh, as I did before, that we weren't. Uh, they wanted to know why we were attacking Afghanistan. I said, well, to put this in values that you hold dear, hospitality, loyalty, and revenge, I said, before we recognize certain members of Al-Qaeda as a threat, we invited them into our country, we gave them hospitality, and then without warning they struck on 9-11. So we wanted revenge. So we went to the Taliban government, asked them to turn over it. the Al-Qaeda leadership so we could bring them to justice. They refused, so we attacked. But I said we did so with a heavy heart, I said, because most Americans have great respect and admiration for the Afghan people, stemming from our common struggle against the former Soviet Union. I said, furthermore, it's important for you to recognize that some of your tribal leaders are now banding together against Al-Qaeda, because they've violated your hospitality. Um, then uh, the, the following question was about uh, uh, why we were attacking Iraq, and I said there was some debate about that, but as far as I was concerned, that too was a matter of revenge, because Saddam Hussein had attempted to assassinate an American president. Um, and then the final penetrating question, I think, was why we su uh, support Israel. I really didn't respond to that one uh, directly. I said, we have a strategic relationship that isn't going to change anytime soon. I said, but what is changing is our understanding of compassion for and support of the Palestinian people. I said, over time, that's going to make a difference. So then we uh, broke for prayer and came back in a smaller group and crafted a confidence-building measure. Uh, before I tell you about that, though, there was one little uh, testy episode in that uh, several-hour discussion, because at one point a very rough-looking gentleman stood up and pointed his finger at me, and he says, I can't talk to you unless you become a Muslim. And I thought for a second, I thought, well, I don't see a problem. I said, uh, Muslim means submission to God. We all submit to God, therefore we're all Muslims. And uh, everybody laughed and we went on with the, our business, but uh, uh, both uh, our project director and the, uh, uh, our Wahhabi partner who had spent a month rounding these Taliban commanders up, most of them from Afghanistan, they got uptight because the standard scenario is you convert or you die. And of course I was totally oblivious to that. And, uh, I thought to myself, well, the Lord really does look out for fools and incompetence, you know. But uh, anyway, we came back and we devised a confidence-building measure that, uh, uh, that played to one of their uh, real concerns. If I had to characterize uh, the whole group of Taliban commanders, they shared in common, one, they seemed to genuinely care about their people. Uh, two, they had a, a visceral hatred for the warlords. And three, they had total disdain for Karzai because of his failure to, con uh, to deliver on his promise to control the warlords. So this confidence building, and, and they, they really begrudged the fact that billions of dollars were flowing into Afghanistan, and none of it was making its way to the village level, at least at that time. So the, the, the measure we came up with was to try to establish a secure zone in the western third of Nuristan, the province right across the way, and to uh, facilitate private development that would come in and, and bypass the government and uh, the warlords. Um, that ultimately failed. We were able to facilitate some in, uh, increased development up in that area through AID, but I was unable to get traction with establishing a secure zone from NATO. It just didn't work. But what one of the, the finer byproducts of that meeting, though, was uh, several months later, when I received a call from the Korean ambassador to the United States asking if there was anything we could do, our center could do, to uh, facilitate the release of the 21 Korean missionaries that were being held hostage by the Taliban. You may recall that back in 2007. Um, so we took that on, and we, we were able to capitalize on the networking associated with that earlier meeting in the mountains to ultimately, it's a long story, it's a fascinating story, but we were able to play an instrumental role in getting those uh, hostages released. A couple of other anecdotes for you. One is uh, um, 
probably about two years ago in uh, the Punjab, we were at a madrasa that was known to be a, a major Al-Qaeda feeder. About 22% of its graduates went into Al-Qaeda. Um, and midway through the uh, workshop, one of the uh, madrasa leaders asked if waging jihad in Kashmir was sanctioned by Islam. And our project director said, no, it's not, but I'm not a religious leader. So he turned to our uh, Wahhabi partner, who enjoys at least honorary mullah status, and he said, no, never to acquire territory, only to defend the faith. Well, this led to a rather heated debate between all the madrasa leaders that were there present. And they came up with a consensus conclusion that the fighting in Kashmir was politically motivated but not religiously sanctioned. So then they set about trying to discuss how they can tone down the militancy of their graduates. See, this is getting back the ideas behind the guns, if you will. Um, I was surprised. Uh, two trips later to Pakistan, I learned that, uh, that that episode in the Punjab had been carried in the newspapers way over in Baluchistan, which was the full breadth of the country away. Uh, so the word travels fast. That particular uh, madrasa in uh, uh, Punjab would send it, the Al-Qaeda would not go fight Americans in Afghanistan. They just became part of the militant movement in Kashmir just because of the ge geographic proximity. The final uh, story I'd share is about a year ago, we were conducting a workshop for 16 madrasas surrounding the, the Swat Valley. And I think many of you remember reading about all the bad things that were happening in the Swat Valley, which in peaceful times was a very desirable resort area, but the Taliban had come in and taken over and a lot of bad things were going on. Well, at the end of the workshop, this one madrasa leader stands up and it turns out that he was a commander in Lashkari Taiba, which is the terrorist group that uh, brought you Mumbai and uh, is thought to have done some other pretty drastic things. He stood up and he said, you know, he says, I came here and I came here for one reason only, and that's to discredit everything you have to say. He says, but I now stand, stand here filled with rage. Rage because for 26 years I have been reading and studying and teaching the Quran the way it was taught to me. He says, for the first time in my life, I feel like I have felt the soul of the Holy Quran and its peaceful intent. He says, the right, the right way to advance Islam is through peace, not through conflict. He says, I'm going to change what I tell my students, and I'm going to tell them why. Well, we came back a month later, uh, and sure enough, uh, he had, was doing exactly as he promised. We also had with us a CNN team. They'd been after us for about three years to document some of our work. And so we finally broke down, we took them in. And, and this gent says the same thing to CNN, for God and the entire world to hear. And that's one of the things that really has bowled me over, is that once you get past the veneer of rage and hostility and engage these folks, not only do they get it, but many of them become personal champions of what you're talking about at great personal risk to themselves. You know, so and, and in the Swat Valley, all you had to do is look cross-eyed and you'd lose your head. I suppose this gent, he's still alive, and I suppose he is because he gets cut a lot of slack for having been a terrorist commander, but, but it's amazing uh, the potential to turn things around if you engage, through respectful engagement, if you will. Well, when I said that we've engaged some 2,700 madrasa leaders from 1,600 madrasas, it sounds like a lot, but it's not. There, there's probably at least 20,000. Uh, not even the government of Pakistan knows how many there are. Uh, but we feel like, because most of the ones we've done are in the more radical areas, that we have sufficient momentum to take this to scale across the country, which is uh, what we're... Uh, right now trying to raise the resources to be able to do. Now, taking it to scale is going to entail a number of actions. One is to uh, uh, 
expand significantly on a university training piece that we put in place. We've done four of these now. Uh, this is where we go over and sort of teach the university faculty what we think uh, the madrasa leaders need to know. And then the madrasa leaders come in and get trained by university faculty. Uh, and this leads to a, it's a step along the way towards certification. Now, why this is important, uh, there's two reasons. One is it introduces accountability where there has been none. There have been no standards uh, or accountability. If you want to open a madrasa, you open a madrasa. Um, second, though, and probably more important, it's the fact that it constitutes a social bridge between the madrasas that feel isolated, insulated, and looked down upon and the and much of Pakistani society, including all of the elites and the universities who do in fact look down upon them. Once these male and female madrasa leaders pass through those university gates, the psychological implications are enormous in terms of their feeling of acceptance. And um, the first one of these was in the University of Karachi and we had uh, uh, chosen our participants very strategically. They were all the oldest sons or stepsons of the owners of the madrasas surrounding Karachi, which were known to be a pretty violent group. Uh, there were 29 of them, and the important thing is that graduation six weeks later, they all brought their fathers, you know, as a, a, a sort of you know a, an element that signifies how important this was to them. Again, back to the psychology piece. Um, we've done uh, that in two other madras uh, universities now as well, but we would see expanding this in a very big way. Uh, a second element is what we call our best practices project, which is that we are trying to develop uh, trying to develop uh, alternative curriculum for the madrasas. Uh, based on best educational practices to be found throughout the Muslim world. And uh, here again, I said that ownership is such a key part to what we do. We're engaging top scholars from each of those five sects to help put this together. And we, for our part, have uh, taken the National Madrasa Oversight Board, and that's the top five religious leaders of the sects that sponsor these schools. We've taken them to Turkey and Egypt to show them how they deal with Islamic education. And truthfully, they went with a bit of an attitude. We've been working with them for a while because you, you're never going to get systemic change unless you have that body fully supportive. Um, they went with a bit of an attitude. You know, what could these secularists teach us religious purists? Well, they came back, they were bowled over and very humble after what they saw because not only were the children of Turkey and Egypt uh, able to hold their own on religious questions every bit as much as any madrasa student in Pakistan, but they were also fully equipped to deal with contemporary problems through their exposure to contemporary subjects, math, science, uh, English, you name it. And <clears throat> so that was one humbling aspect. Another one was the fact that what they saw in both of those countries was very... Uh, trustful relationship between the government and the religious leaders. Now in Turkey, which is sort of a secular country, if you will, uh, you can see how that could evolve that way. Uh, but also in, in Egypt, you could, if you were a cynic, you'd say, yes, well, the government hires all the religious leaders. And that's true, they do, from the Grand Mufti down to the Imam. But nevertheless, whatever the rationale, they work together for the common good of the students. And none of that exists in Pakistan. That's another piece that we're working on behind the scenes. So they came back, and based on that trip, they, cut, they signed an agreement with the government of Pakistan that would call for uniform educational standards, uh, inclusion of contemporary subjects, and uh, foregoing any uh, dimension of violence or militancy at all. <clears throat> now, signing on the line is one thing. That's a far cry from actually implementing it. And in all of these past agreements, one of the things you find is uh, uh, almost uniformly the government never comes through. Uh, they just, 
They just don't see their way clear to devote resources to education, and it really has some frightening implications. I mean, the whole public school system is in total disarray. Uh, the madrasas, I've been telling you about them, the only ones that seem to get a decent education are the, the children of parents who can afford to send them to private schools. <coughs> so, so here you have a, a very nuclear capable nation and it's really coming unglued because they never see their way clear to improve the literacy of their people, you know, give them healthy employment and the like. Another aspect is uh, ramping up the training that we're doing for the women, uh, the female leaders of the girls' madrasas. For the first three years that we were there, the women wanted us to provide them the same training, but we uh, wouldn't do it because the men were opposed to it. And finally, after three years, the men asked us to do it. And uh, it's been wonderful. I mean, as you, no surprise, the women get it twice as fast as the men. And we have, uh, uh, there's a, a quote, a very uh, disarming quote, and, and this is a poor uh, version of it, but uh, it's a woman saying that, you know, you can work with the men as long as you want. If you want real change, work with us. We control them, you know, so. And it's, and it's pretty true. And why the women are so critically important there is, you know, because of their station in life, is Islam is con has been backed into a corner over the years. One of the few uh, bastions that they have control over are their women. And so the women uh, suffer in many areas, uh, and we're all very mindful of that. Some of it's not quite what you read or would think, but uh, it's not a very enlightened uh, approach. Uh, so they tend to be uh, purer than Caesar's wife when it comes to the uh, honoring the is Islamic scriptures and the uh, precepts and the like. They just have to be a, a, an unquestioning example. And they also, as is true in all cultures, they have a monopoly over the uh, uh, raising the formative years of the children before they even reach the madrasas. So getting to them is just key. And that uh, uh, we've, in several of the workshops we've had, we've been able to leave behind vocational training uh, uh, institutes where the women, the starting out with sewing, and it will go to other skills as well. So that's another piece of it. And final piece is that we put in place the legal framework for an indigenous NGO, a Pakistani NGO that once we have it fully staffed and have, and it's operating on all cylinders and doesn't need, need no longer needs any fundraising or technical assistance from us, uh, then we will cut it free and it will oversee the uh, expansion of our work across the entire country. And, and then we'll be off to other pastures because, you know, our concept is what we're there to do is to help the indigenous leaders to help themselves. And uh, sometimes it's uh, helping grow that leadership, but uh, we're not, we're, we're, we're neither in the business of perpetuating anything we do uh, beyond what's needed, uh, nor are we really uh, an organization that's about education. We're doing it just because it's so strategic. And uh, not only, if we succeed, not only does this mean a brighter future for the children of Pakistan, but to the extent that it counters the extremism, it's a brighter future for our own children as well. And let me just conclude by saying that just as setting a counterfire is often a good antidote for a blaze that's raging out of control, uh, so too can religious reconciliation be an antidote to religious extremism. In a context where uh, religious imperatives trump all, uh, the best antidote for religious ignorance is religious understanding. And this business of trying to make religion part of the solution in these conflicts is not without its challenges. It's psychologically, physically, and emotionally draining, and uh, there are the obvious risks. All of us know the, the, the parade of spiritually motivated peacemakers who've paid the ultimate price, like uh, Gandhi and 
Martin Luther King Jr., Anwar Sadat, uh, Rabin, uh, the list goes on. But I submit to you that despite the risks or whatever discomfort one might feel in navigating these relatively uncharted waters of spiritual engagement, the stakes are simply too high for us not to give it our best shot. And only time will tell if we're up to the task. So thank you very much and be happy to take questions.